This video has been made possible by Haygears. The final stage of the wireless charging project is to make the flexible polyurethane parts, including the pad for the base to give it some grip and a pad to cover the MagSafe charger. To create these, I need to make some rigid moulds. As I've already designed and test printed the components, I can build off those CAD models and use those to design the moulds. So as I've been designing the moulds, there's certain things I've had to keep in mind to make sure the moulds are actually going to work. So on the pad, you've got internal and external draft angles, which will cause the mould to lock together. So if we take a look at the cross section of the mould, we'll be able to see why we're going to have some issues taking these two halves apart. So with an empty mould, you can see we just have enough clearance for these two halves to nest together. But as soon as we cast something into it, you can see that with these two draft angles, we've essentially made two undercuts. So if we try and remove the back with the pad attached to it, because it would come out with that side, you can see that we'll end up fouling here. Well, we wouldn't even get to that point. It just physically wouldn't move. So the way to overcome this would be to eliminate at least one of the draft angles. Because the part's flexible, if we can just get one side off, then we can peel the pad off the other side. Obviously, I can't make those changes to the pad itself because I can't change that geometry. So we're going to have to make those changes to the mold side. One route I could take is to have one of the sides split perpendicular to the main split line. This way I can slide the two halves apart, avoiding that undercut issue, and then I can peel the pad off the other side. The only issue with this is that it's going to leave evidence on the front of the part that there was a split line in the mold. No matter how well those two halves meet, you'll always get a flash line at the join. So with this being a flexible polyurethane, I can't sand this down and prep it like I would if it was a rigid part because it just doesn't quite act the same. So I need to make sure this comes out of the mold as a finished product that doesn't need any prep work to the front. So the way I'm going to tackle this is to have the two rigid sides still, but have a silicon insert in there as well. Because that's in there, I'm able to redesign the internals of the back piece, so that will come off easily. With the silicon being flexible, I can just peel that off as well, eliminating the problem with the undercut. And then because the other side's been removed, I can also peel the flexible pad off as well. So the pad for the base is much more straightforward because it's not got any draft angles to it. So I can just use those two rigid sides as the mould without the need for any additional inserts. Now these are done, I can slice the models and send them over to the printer. I'm printing these on the Haygears Ultracraft Reflex printer again, but I'm using their new PAWR10 resin. This resin is tough and durable, so for mould longevity, it makes sense to use this resin in this application. As these are quite large components, I'm using the pulse and release module again to reduce the print time and the amount of supports needed. For anyone considering picking up one of these printing systems, you can use the code RTA Fabrication at checkout. This will get you $100 off and a free bottle of resin with your order. I'll leave more details on this down in the video description. Before I can use these parts, I need to prep them by removing the supports, washing and curing them. Then I can clip and sand off the remaining supports going through the grits from 120 to 400, being careful not to dull any of the details inside the mould cavity. I've been as strategic as possible with the support placement to make sure they're not attached directly to any detailed areas. Using the pulse and release module has also allowed me to reduce the amount of supports needed as well. In the CAD model, I've also added information to the moulds on the outside surface. I set the text in by 0.5 mil so I could paint it then sand away the top surface, leaving the paint behind inside the text. I could have just written this on in Sharpie or saved it as a note in my phone, but honestly, it's just an excuse to make the moulds look cool. I've also incorporated holes where I can glue some nuts in, so I'm able to bolt the two halves together. As a final step to the prep work, I'm shot blasting the cavity of the base pad mould to give it a consistent grainy texture that the resin will take an impression of on the final component. 
So the mold for the base is ready to use, but I've still got to make that silicon insert for the pad mold. Now this is made up of three different pieces. You've got the lower section, which is used to pour the silicon into to actually make that silicon insert. But this is also used later on in the casting stage to hold that insert in place. We've got these two top sections which go on top of that. The first one is just for actually making the silicon insert. So this has got features on it that I want the silicon to capture. And it's also got the master built into it. So rather than having a separate master, that's all in one. It's just a one time use thing. Once I move over to the casting stage, I'll use this one instead. This one's got a flat section rather than those features, which creates a gap for that excess resin to come out of. But it's also got an offset version of the pad, which is smaller, which will create the actual cavity to form the pad itself. There's not much prep work to do for pouring the silicon other than some prep work on the master itself. As this is a mold negative with the master built in, I need to finish it to look and feel exactly how I want the final component to look as the silicon will capture the surface's finish. I miss the paint on in multiple passes to create a grain, rotating the part for even coverage. I'll do this three or four times to build up the grain. If I'm molding the part, I won't touch the surface after, but if it's an actual final component, I'll wipe away any of the loose overspray. If molding, it's important to allow the paint to gas off the solvents to prevent any silicon cure inhibitions. I always use Ease Release 200 when I'm making silicon molds and when I'm casting into them. It's very thin, doesn't build up on the surface and leaves a nice consistent matte finish. And then once I've done that, I can bolt the two mold halves together. This is an addition or platinum cure silicon, which I use for all my silicon molds. In my experience, it tends to last a lot longer than condensation or tin cured silicons, and it has much less shrinkage. It's sure 28A, so it's a relatively soft silicon as well. This doesn't need to be degassed. It's always best if you can, but if you don't have a vacuum chamber and you're trying out silicon molding, you could stretch pour it. This is where you'd pour from a height of about one meter in a very thin stream to a single point in the mold that's not directly on the part. Doing this will reduce the amount of bubbles left in the mixture once it's poured. So before I pour the silicon, I want to prop the mold up to make sure the silicon's starting at the lowest point and there's a single air hole at the highest point. So this extra wedge is tilting the mold this way. So when I pour the silicon in, it'll run down into this bottom corner and then fill the mold up that way ending at that top air hole. I don't want the mold filling up this way, parallel to this back edge, because there's more chance of air getting trapped in these areas where there aren't air holes. So that's why it's good practice to put that air hole at the top so you can drive all the air just towards that single point. Once that one's filled, this one becomes the lowest point. So again, same thing, it'll lead all the way up to that last air hole. As the silicon reaches the air holes, I can let them purge slightly just to make sure all the air is cleared from that area. Then use a small ball of filleting wax to stop the silicon from flowing out. Once the mold's full, I can set that level and wait for it to cure. Typically, I pour silicon towards the end of the day so I can leave it overnight to cure. You could heat the silicon up to achieve a full cure in a matter of hours. I usually avoid this though, as I don't like running the risk of the master or the materials expanding as the expansion can throw off the tolerances of the part that I'm molding. Now it's cured, I can take it apart and get ready to pour in the resin. Something to note, and this is me being really particular, but I never actually touch any of the surfaces of my molds. If I were to touch the surface of the mold, it would leave a surface mark, print, or some sort of evidence that I have touched it. That mark will be present on all the cast parts out of that mold. This is more noticeable on a surface with a uniform finish, like in this case, and as I can't prep or sand the final component, I want to make sure that it stays mark free, so I don't like to ever take that risk. Before casting, I can apply the same mold release, switch out the mold negative side for the side that has the inside of the pad attached and apply mold release to that as well. I've given myself two resin options to make these from, a Shore 30 and a Shore 60. I feel like the softer Shore 30 will be better suited to the pad on the bottom of the base 
and the Shaw 60 for the main pad just to give the thin section on the front face some rigidity. I'm adding black pigment to part A. I've used a measured amount for the density of the pigment that I want. The resin is mixed in the same way as any other polyurethane resin at a one to one ratio. This also doesn't need to be degassed, but degassing will improve the structural properties. So it's definitely worth doing in this case, again, because of how thin that front section is. I've calculated the volume of resin so it fills the cavities, goes into the overflow, but doesn't overfill and seep out of the side of the mold itself. I can then put the top half on, displacing the resin and secure the two halves together. I can do the same for the base mould, bolt them together and get both of these into the pressure pot. I'm mainly using this for the base pad to eliminate any small air traps caused when I poured the resin over the fine text and details. Now these have cured, I can demould them and see if they've worked. And they didn't. I got air trapped in the mould because of the way I put the second half on. Without thinking, I put the mould half on parallel to the other half, whereas I should have angled it to push the air out in a similar way to when I angled the mould when I was pouring in the silicon. To add insult to injury, I also forgot to put mould release on this side of the base mould, so that's stuck in there and that mould's now scrap. These things happen, but after re-pouring the pad mould and paying attention to how I close it, that's worked out perfectly. The paint finish on the master has transferred over nicely with the grainy matte texture. To prep this, it's a case of trimming off the excess from the overflow. In the future, I'll likely print a jig for this where I can put the pad on and there'll be a guide where I can quickly run the blade around to trim off the excess. So I had planned on reprinting this mould, but I've realised there's a much better way I can approach making this part. Not because of the mould type, because we've proved that works with the pad mould, but more so from an efficiency point of view. So I've redesigned it in a way that's going to eliminate me having to glue this part into the base once it's cast. So building up the base hasn't changed. I'll still add the steel ball bearings in for weight, backfill that with resin, and then put that insert piece on with the pins. They submerge into the resin, and then once that cures, that becomes solid. And then at that point, I was going to glue that pad onto that flat surface. But to eliminate that last step, I've made some changes to this insert piece by adding these tabs and also a load of holes. So the tabs locate into the mould. This suspends the part above, forming the cavity underneath. These do get cut off afterwards, so they are just a tool at this point, just to keep that level right and keep that part parallel to the mould. The holes are there mainly for air holes, but if resin does come through them, it will just make the bond a bit more secure. Although after not putting mold release on the first mold, I know that that resin bonds really well to these parts. So moving forward, I can apply the mold release, mix and degas the resin as I did before and pour that into the mold. The circles on each of the corners are there to give me excess material that I can use to help remove the part from the mould once it's cured. Once it's cured, I can remove it from the mould. As I've over moulded a rigid component, removing it from the mould does take more effort than it could. I intend to make some multi-cavity moulds at some point so I can make a few of these at the same time. I might redesign it again so it has a silicon insert like the pad mould, but as it is, it does create a usable part. I designed in some score lines so I can score and snap the tabs off, then sand the remaining material flush. I can also trim away the excess resin from around the corners 
If I do make a silicon version, I probably won't need those circles on the corners as well, which will save me another step in the process. This sits inside the base really well. It sits just a fraction past the bottom, so the pad is the only contact point when it'll be standing up. Now that's done, I can paint the base and fill it with the steel ball bearings. I can backfill that with just the regular polyurethane resin, insert the pad so the pins submerge into the resin, and then leave that to cure. Now it's time for the final assembly. If you've watched any of the previous videos in this series, you'll be very familiar with how this all goes together. Straight away, even from the sound of setting the base down on the worktop, I can tell how much nicer it is with that pad on the bottom. I can finally use the newly designed charger holder as well that attaches from the front. I'm glad I made that change as it'll be so much easier to swap this piece out for the non-charging version that's got the magnets built in. Once I've got the rest of the components attached, I can install the flexible pad over the top. The reason it has those internal draft angles is so that it can hold itself in position rather than having any adhesive or fixings. I like how easy this is to install and remove, which opens up the possibility of doing different versions with different designs or patterns on the front that can be quickly swapped out. As a bonus, the flexible polyurethane with that grainy texture adds even more grip making the phone even more secure when it's attached. So it's nice to get to a point where I can say these are finally finished and I'm happy with those last two additions. I think they've really finished it off nicely. In the previous video, I mentioned about doing a limited run, which is still the case. So initially I'm thinking of doing a batch of 10 of each version, mainly so I can get an idea of what the actual production workflow looks like and making these in batches. So if anybody is interested in one, uh, there's a link in the description where you can sign up for updates on these as well as anything I put out in the future like uh, guides or exclusive video content or anything around mold making and getting into this kind of thing. So check that out if you can. Uh, the next stage to this is going to be doing the production workflow itself. Uh, I probably will document it with a follow-up video because I'm planning to do some multi-cavity molds and some matrix molds. And I get asked a lot about the planning side of it and how I judge uh, where to put split lines, what's moldable, how to design something in a way that is moldable, that kind of thing. So I think that would be valuable to document that and go through that side of the process as well. Uh, the last thing is, if you are planning to get one of the printers, remember discount code in the description, RTA Fabrication, that'll get you $100 off and a free bottle of resin when you order. So it's definitely worth checking it out for the saving. Let me know in the comments as well if there's anything specific that you want me to cover in future videos because your suggestions will help me come up with project ideas that incorporate those themes. So thanks again for watching and I appreciate the support.